Hello, my name is Andrew Jenks. I'm a palliative medicine consultant. I'm here to give you a brief tutorial about uh, pain and pain control. Let's start by giving you a brief definition of what pain is. So pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Another definition could be that pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is. Think about when particularly dealing with patients with a potentially life-threatening or life-limiting condition and pain alongside that, the concept of total pain. So yes, a good physical assessment of the pain is important, but we also want to take into account the potential that there may be psychological, social or spiritual components to the pain experience as well. That's not relevant to all patients, but do bear it in mind for some patients as part of your assessment. When we move on to doing the physical assessment, there are lots of different tools you could use. Probably the most commonly used one and most commonly known one is the Socrates pain assessment. We want to think about the site of the pain, the onset, the character of the pain, perhaps using the patient's own words, the radiation of the pain, any associated symptoms alongside the pain experience, the time course, whether there are any exacerbating or relieving factors that are relevant, and what the severity of the pain is as well, perhaps using a visual analogue scale of naught to 10. Then when we come on to management, we could use the WHO pain ladder. This was designed for patients with cancer pain, but can be applied in other circumstances as well. So there are three steps to the WHO pain ladder. Step one is non-opioids, such as paracetamol. Step two, are opioids for mild to moderate pain, such as codeine, dihydrocodeine and tramadol, and step three are opioids for moderate to severe pain, such as morphine, oxycodone, uh, buprenorphine or fentanyl. Non-opioids can be continued all the way through the WHO pain ladder, and that adjuvants can be used at any step on the WHO pain ladder, and I'll talk a little bit more about adjuvant analgesics in a little while. We're going to concentrate on talking about strong opioids. I'm not going to talk to you about codeine or tramadol at this point. So the strong opioids most commonly that you will come across are morphine and oxycodone, which come as uh, oral or parenteral uh, preparations, and fentanyl and buprenorphine, which come, generally speaking, in patches. There are different ways of prescribing the different drugs, and it's important that you go and look those up or refer to the BNF, or your local palliative care guidelines. Let me talk to you a little bit about the general principles of starting a strong opioid. The first thing to remember is that there are conversion ratios between different drugs. So for example, if you're converting somebody from codeine to morphine, remember that there is a conversion ratio between those two drugs. There are lots of conversion tables freely available online. You can download those onto your smartphone. You can print out a copy and carry it around with you in your pocket. It's up to you. Don't try and remember what the conversion ratio actually is. Just remember that you need to look it up. The general principles are that you start low and you titrate up. Ideally, starting with a regular prescription of one of the immediate release preparations of the oral medication if the patient is able to take things orally and prescribe that regularly every four hours. So the immediate release preparation of morphine and oxycodone should last for about four hours. Their onset of action is about 20 to 30 minutes. When the patient's pain is controlled, you can then convert them to one of the modified release or sustained release preparations of either morphine or oxycodone. Remember as well to prescribe a PRN dose, an as required dose as well. And the PRN dose is based upon the total background dose in 24 hours that the patient is on. The PRN dose is a sixth of the total dose in 24 hours. If a patient is on, for example, 30 milligrams, twice a day of sustained release morphine, 60 milligrams in total, a sixth of that is 10 milligrams of immediate release preparation morphine sulfate. The same goes with, with oxycodone. For uh, fentanyl patches and buprenorphine patches, the doses are slightly different, so we refer to your conversion table. 
Let's talk a little bit about the sort of side effects that patients might experience when they're started on opioids. The most common one, of course, is constipation, and any opioid can cause constipation. Fentanyl and buprenorphine tend to be a bit less constipating, but they still cause constipation. So it's advisable to prescribe a laxative alongside your regular prescription of opioid. Patients may also experience nausea and vomiting. So perhaps prescribing an antiemetic alongside is important as well. Nausea and vomiting tends to be self-limiting, so it wears off after a few days. So encourage a patient to continue and persevere with the drug if possible, um, and hopefully the nausea and vomiting should go away. Drowsiness may also occur in the first few days, and that tends also to go away after a few days on a steady dose. Itch and sweating are also side effects that we very occasionally see, but they're really not very common. I want to talk a bit about opioid toxicity. Clearly, if the patient is unconscious and has a reduced GCS and a respiratory rate of less than eight, that is an emergency situation and they need naloxone. Most patients will start to develop more subtle signs of opioid toxicity that we should be picking up on and reacting to before patients become unconscious or develop uh, respiratory depression. So the more subtle early signs that you might see are myoclonic jerks. So this is not a fine tremor, it's some coarse jerky movements, particularly of the limbs. Patients may notice it when they go to reach for a cup or something like that. Patients may become a bit more drowsy, perhaps a bit confused, and they may develop hallucinations or vivid dreams. The hallucinations with opioid toxicity will be visual. If patients have got other types of hallucinations, it's very unlikely to be because of their opioids. They may also develop pinpoint pupils. And when we start to see those signs and symptoms, start thinking about why the patient may, be, may have become opioid toxic. And usually, switching to a different opioid or slightly reducing the dose of the opioid is sufficient. Why might patients become opioid toxic if, they become, if they're on a steady dose of opioid? Well, another analgesic may have been added, which is helping with their pain, so they no longer require the same amount of opioid. Remember as well that morphine and oxycodone are both renally excreted. So if somebody's kidney function has gone off, then uh, they will not be able to excrete the opioid out of the system quite so effectively, so they will begin to develop signs of opioid toxicity. Now, if somebody's EGFR is less than 30, morphine is contraindicated, and we'd want to use an alternative opioid. Fentanyl and buprenorphine are safer in renal impairment, and oxycodone is safer as well, although it is still renally excreted. If you have a patient who has got renal impairment, refer to your local palliative care guidelines or speak to your palliative care team. They will be more than happy to offer advice to you. Moving away from opioids, let's think briefly about neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is caused by damage to the nerves um, and resulting in pain. It can be due to a whole host of things. Cancer itself can cause pressure or compression on nerves and cause pain. Equally, chemotherapy drugs and other drugs and things like diabetes can cause neuropathic pain as well. Some patients will get benefit from opioids and other simple analgesics uh, from their neuropathic pain, but many won't. And you may want to think about using a neuropathic agent in that situation. The drugs that we typically use are tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline and nortriptyline, or uh, anticonvulsants such as gabapentin and pregabalin. Again, just as with opioids, start low and titrate up. The other thing that's important to say about neuropathic pain is that the effect won't come straight away. So patients will probably not get benefit until five to seven days after starting a neuropathic agent. So you need to tell patients that and ask them to persevere with the drug. May I also refer you to your local palliative care guidelines. For those of you working in Wessex, you are able to get one of these green Wessex guideline books from the palliative care team in the hospital in which you're working. Alternatively, you can download them uh, for free as a PDF uh, onto your smartphones or laptops. If you simply go to Google and do a Google search for the Wessex Palliative Care Physicians uh, Handbook or Guidelines, you should come up with a link to that PDF. And that goes for people working outside of Wessex as well. 
you will be able to download that PDF for free. Thanks for listening.